The OSI model stands for the Open Systems Interconnection Reference Model. And it's a way to help us understand how all of this network communication happens when it is used by an application. It goes across the network, and it's seen by an application on the other side. But it's just a guide. Don't get too wrapped up in the details of the OSI configuration. Certain protocols fit between layers. You could even have long conversations about whether a certain protocol really fits at layer 5, whether it really fits at layer 6. It's really something that is designed to be a model and something you can help reference. It's not meant to be a be-all, end-all of exactly how everything works out here in the real world. There are unique protocols at every layer. And as we step through these layers in this video, we're going to look at those and see where each one of these protocols happens to sit. You're going to use this model for the rest of your career. And it becomes very useful when you're troubleshooting your network or you're trying to explain to someone else, why am I seeing a certain thing happening at layer 3 or layer 4? And that way, they'll know exactly what you are talking about. If you need a good way to help remember the application presentation session, transport, network, data link, and physical layers, you can even use this mnemonic, which is all people seem to need data processing. Layer 1 of the OSI model is the physical layer. So we're not really talking about protocols at this point. We're more interested in signaling. We're more interested in how the cabling is working, how the connectors are working on the devices that we are using. When we talk about problems at this layer, we usually will say you have a layer 1 problem. You have a physical layer issue. And we mean that you're having a problem with cabling. You're having a problem with your punch downs. You're having a problem with your network interface card being able to send the proper signal so that it's seen by the equipment on your network. And so you're usually swapping out cables and interface cards and trying to get the signal to work back and forth. The problem has nothing to do with your web server. The problem has everything to do with the copper or the fiber that's being used to communicate using your web server. OSI layer 2 is the data link layer. And this is the fundamental layer that devices use to communicate with each other over the network. We are talking about, in the world of Ethernet, for instance, the MAC addresses that are used. These are two network interface cards on the screen that represent two stations talking to each other. And the way that they communicate to each other is with this address. This is a MAC address, a media access control address that is used. Every Ethernet device on your network has a unique MAC address. And this makes it very easy for devices to communicate with each other because they know exactly where to send this when they're sending it out over the network. Network. And because of that, we usually refer to the MAC address as the Layer 2 address of your computer. This is also the layer that is used for switching. We have these network switches today. In some cases, in enterprises, we have these very, very large LAN switches with hundreds of ports on them. And the way that they determine where a packet is to go is they have an enormous table full of these MAC addresses. And when a packet comes in, it determines where the destination for this packet should go. It looks it up, and it's big list of MAC addresses, and it sends it off to the appropriate port inside of the switch. And because of that, we often refer to OSI Layer 2 as the switching layer. Layer 3 of the OSI model is the network layer. And this is where IP addresses live, because that's also where we're doing routing. When we talk about having a router that looks at these IP addresses. We're really talking about this Layer 3 address. So here are two workstations. These are IP addresses communicating between them. There might be a router in the middle. And the router determines where information is going based on the destination IP address. It has a list of where all the routes are, and it sends it out that connection. At this point, the router really doesn't care what MAC addresses are involved. All it knows is this Layer 3 IP address. And if you're using frame sizes in Ethernet that are too big to traverse certain networks along the way, then this layer is also responsible for fragmenting that information into smaller pieces. The IP fragmentation process is relatively straightforward. We have this entire frame that will not fit through another network. And we have everything past the IP header, which is your TCP header in this case. And there may be some data associated with this particular packet. We're going to split that information up into smaller pieces. And instead of sending it all in one single frame, 
we're splitting it up into three separate ones. So as those packets are going across the network, they're going to show up on the other side, and the end station on the other side is going to put them back together again. One of the things you'll always notice about this if you're looking at a protocol decode is the fragments are always going to be in a multiple of eight, because that's the number of bits available to specify what the offset is for this fragmentation. Layer 4 of the OSI model is the transport layer. And I refer to this layer as the post office layer. This is where we aren't worried about the envelope that's getting from post office to post office. We're interested in what's inside that envelope. We want to know exactly what's inside that parcel that is being sent across the network. And it's this layer 4 that's responsible for transporting that information from one side of the network to another. Two very common protocols you'll see at this layer are the TCP layer for transmission control protocol and UDP, which is the user datagram protocol. These protocols work in different ways, but they are always working at this layer 4, the transport layer of the OSI model. Session 5 of the OSI model, the session layer, is responsible for making sure that we're able to set up sessions and maintain sessions between devices. So it's a little bit higher than the layer of sending information at layer 4. We're now being able to tunnel information using this layer. We're able to do duplex, like half duplex and full duplex of application communication all at this layer 5, the session layer. So we're able to make sure that if we connect to a device, that we're able to then send information to that device because the session is open and available. And it's also this layer that's responsible for tearing down that session once we have completed that communication process. The presentation layer of the OSI model, layer 6, is responsible for putting this information into a format that us human beings are able to read. If it was all a bunch of binary information on the screen, it would be difficult to understand the application. So this layer is responsible for the character encoding. It's responsible for encrypting information and decrypting information so that we are then able to view it. And we often combine this layer with layer 7, because a lot of things associated with the way the application works works as a, at a combination of these two things together, Layer 6 and Layer 7 combined. Layer 7 is the application layer, and that is finally the layer that we get to see on the screen of our computer. Normally, this is one that is sending information to web servers. It's getting our email and displaying it for us. It's showing us database information that we requested, and it's displaying that on a screen in a format that we can understand. All of these layers of the OSI model work together so that you're able to send information from one computer to another, and everything works seamlessly all the way through the network.